Good morning. Welcome to the 2019 Rural Arts and Culture Summit. <laughs> My name is Michelle Anderson, and I'm the Rural Program Director at Springboard for the Arts. I, <laughs> I use the pronouns she, her, hers. As we gather this morning for the 2019 Rural Arts and Culture Summit in Gagajanagwagag, Grand Rapids, located between the Leech Lake, Fond du Lac, Boys Fort, and Mille Lacs Reservations, we want to acknowledge that this event takes place on settled and colonized lands. We acknowledge that we are located within the homeland of the Anishinaabe Ojibwe Nation, and we offer respect and gratitude for the traditional stewards and inhabitants of this land, the Ojibwe people. We are very grateful guests. This morning, I am honored to introduce Gary Charwood from the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe, who has agreed to help us open up the Rural Arts and Culture Summit. Please join me in welcoming Gary Charwood to the stage. Ah, bonjour. Ani and Schnabek, bonjour and the way Magana Duke. The issue in unconditional cars, Manga do them. While we eat a mug and do chiba, because you got squatch and milk, I can do chiba. I just uh, opened up with uh, our Anishinaabe name, our, our, uh, with our uh, language, the Anishinaabe Moen. It is our first language. English is our second language in the Ojibwe Anishinaabe territories. And I'm honored to be here with you to share Bungi Kido, the little bit that I do know in my language, because uh, historical uh, events uh, plagued our people. And uh, so I really have to uh, work extremely extra hard to regain, to get my language so that someday soon, like my mother, who is with us yet today, is a fluent speaker. And because of the uh, historical events, um, they never spoke to us in our language. And both my father and my mother were both fluent speakers in our language. So I'm a product of that, but I don't dwell on it. I move forward. I live the best I can, the best I know how. And I'm honored to be here with you. And miigwech, Kayla, for inviting me and to be here to be a part of this. And um, I'm going to uh, share one of my sacred items. Uh, we call it the poagan, uh, the pipe. I'm going to share that with you today, this morning, and also the medicine that I bring with. And I'm going to put the, um, once I fill my pipe with tobacco that was given to me to come and do this, to speak, and give good goodness to this morning, that's all I ask is for you to observe, listen, and I'm going to ask and invite you as well to come and share and to come and use and take some of the medicine that will be burning over here. And it's just a good way to purify, to cleanse, to start this beautiful day that Creator has given us another day. And again, it's just to live in harmony and balance, love, care, nurture, support each other the best we can. So with that, I'm going to, during when I'm doing the prayer with the pipe, I'll uh, have to ask the cameras to uh, shut down. But you can during the opening. But just when I light the pipe, I'll ask you guys to, uh, to uh, not take pictures or um, run the camera. Or it's just one of our protocols. One of our, you'll see it done throughout uh, the country. Uh, throughout Turtle Island, and I'm very pleased to hear that half the country, half of Turtle Island is here with us in Grand Rapids. 25 states, amazing, <laughs> just amazing to, and to come together to have the gift, to share all your gifts and all your talents, 
all the work that you do. Uh, it's just amazing, and I'm very grateful to be here. So with that, I'm going to get started, and I will uh, just bear with me. I will uh, light the smudge, fill the pipe, and I'm going to carry the, the, the sage bowl over here. And feel free to come down. Just come down, absorb, take the medicine in. And as I always say, whatever happened this morning and whatever happened yesterday, let it go. Just let it be. And, and this day, this new day, Minuki Shigad, that's a good day. And uh, here we are, and we'll move forward. As I acknowledge, uh, in the four directions, we always start from the east as the light, as the new day begins. It is our way that we acknowledge Wabanung, eastern direction. And that everything that comes with. Then I always go to the south, Shawanung. It's the then over to the west, Nikapianung. Over to the north, Giwaden, Giwadenung. I always acknowledge that four-legged being, the only thing that can stand and live in that direction. In our Madewan ways, that's a, that's a high degree. We acknowledge that great white polar bear. Everything that we acknowledge is in a plant form or in an animal form. So we pay tribute, acknowledge those, those beings because they live here with us. So I always acknowledge that. And Mother Earth, everything she provides for us, everything she gives us. And that lake, the water, all through Turtle Island. I'm gonna acknowledge our sacred water and everything that she provides. And also the, I always call them the little people, Minuesio Gado ones that take care, that live. Also for the, the medicine, the giku, the fish. All these things, without them, without it, we won't exist. So we acknowledge that in our prayer. And also you, as I opened up, Niju and Nung, I said, is my name, translates to two star, which my grandfather, the late Bill Perkins from Wabashi, walked with that name. Mong Duodema, I said, that's my clan. I'm from the Loon clan. I'm very honored to share that with you. I'm very honored to share the medicine. You look down at my, uh, Eagle fan. This lady, elderly lady, made this for me. She was 80 years old when she beaded that. She had, because she loved the, the loon and acknowledged the loon clan with the brothers, sisters of the crane clan. And I'm very grateful. Just thought I would share that with you. So art has no age. Art has no color, it is who we are. And again, I want to say miigwech for allowing me to be here with you and to send that good energy so that you, as I said earlier, have a good day. Ha miu. What a beautiful way to start our time together. That was very special. So welcome to the Miles Rife Performing Arts Center. I'm Chantel Dow, the executive director for the Rife. After completing a grand renovation and expansion project in the spring of 2016, the Rife Center is considered a premier multi-purpose performing arts facility in northern Minnesota. It is home to two stages 
this Wilcox Theater, which is 700 seats, and the adjacent Ives Studio Theater, which is an intimate 200 seat space. We also house three dance studios, an art gallery, a theater education program, and the offices of our partners, the Itasca Orchestra and Strings Program and the Grand Rapids Players Community Theater. Together, we open our doors to thousands of children, families, and arts enthusiasts with exciting artistic programs almost every day of the year. Annually, the Rife hosts over 60 national and international touring performances from dance to music and children's theater and much more. We are excited to announce that this season is the 30th anniversary of the Rife Dance Program. There's thousands of students that have had unique opportunities to perform on this stage and work with national touring dance companies. And Deirdre Murnane is our dance director. Deirdre, give a little wave. So she does a phenomenal job uh, teaching over 150 students each year in our dance spaces, which you'll get to experience while you're here. We offer many opportunities for children in communities. Programs include participation in uh, live theater, and then also we bus kids in to attend live performances from touring artists. We also uh, are going to partner with the McPhail Center for Music in Minneapolis and provide parent and child classes called Sing, Play, Learn. The mission of the Rife Arts Council is to stimulate arts in northern Minnesota. As a recent transplant from Iowa to Grand Rapids, I extend a very warm welcome to all of you, and I'm very excited to share our community and facility and to experience with you the beauty, the wonder, and the importance of the arts. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Laura Zabel. I'm the executive director of Springboard for the Arts, and I am so happy to welcome you to the Rural Arts and Culture Summit. Um, I'm so grateful to Gary for starting us off connected to what is sacred. Our intention is that this gathering of people in this place is sacred. I'm here to offer much gratitude and thanks to numerous people. Um, First of all, I want to thank Springboard's amazing rural program staff based in Fergus Falls, Naomi, Dominic, Hannah, Nancy. <laughs> Springboard's amazing urban staff based in St. Paul, many of whom are here and, and helping out today. And the, <laughs> and the unstoppable, amazing, intentional, holder of this space, holder of this work, and leader to all of us, Michelle Anderson. There are a lot of people and organizations that have made this work possible and these several days possible. We have amazing funders and supporters like the McKnight Foundation, the Bush Foundation, Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies, Blandin Foundation, the Minnesota State Arts Board, and the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund of the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment. <laughs> Wonderful and intentional collaborators and partners like this beautiful Rife Center, the McCrosty Arts Center, Arrowhead Regional Arts Council, and Visit Grand Rapids. and scholarship partners that made it so that many of you could be here and join us today. The Region 2 Arts Council, Southwest Minnesota Arts Council, Southeastern Minnesota Arts Council, Arrowhead Arts Council, and the Iowa Arts Council. Also have a couple housekeeping announcements. Uh, just a reminder that there are some off-site sessions during the breakouts, both at the McCrosty Art Center and the Old Central School. Those are really wonderful sessions. Make sure to give yourself time to get there and back. We really encourage you to take the Joyride bus. Even if you drove here today, you can take the bus to the breakouts. It will be making loops during the break, and we'll bring you back here for lunch if you go to one of those off-site breakouts this morning. 
Don't forget that tonight is the first Friday art walk. There's a map and schedule in your materials. There'll be food trucks um, and live music and drinks. Uh, make sure to get a ticket. If you don't already have a ticket for the food trucks, you can get those at the registration. If you have any questions during the day, please seek out somebody with a pink lanyard. Um, we can either help you or find the person who can help you. Uh, also, I want to express today um, deep gratitude and, and acknowledgement uh, that joining us today at the fifth Rural Arts and Culture Summit is Rebecca Peterson, who is one of the instigators of the very first Rural Arts and Culture Summit in Fergus Falls. And <laughs> and is also the person who invited and asked Springboard if we would be willing and interested in carrying this project forward. And I think we go back to Rebecca every time we do this and hope that we are making her proud. So thank you. From its very beginning, that first time in Fergus Falls, the Rural Arts and Culture Summit has been rooted in values of place and connection. And as it has evolved these five times, the summit has become even more firmly rooted in a set of practices and values that stem from Springboard's own work and the work of our local and national partners and collaborators and many of you in the room. And I wanted to talk a little bit this morning about what those values are. The first one is that this gathering is practitioner focused. The, sum, the summit has and always will be focused on the people who do the work in their communities. We are interested in celebrating all of you, the people who wake up every day and try to make their place better and healthier for more people. Our goal for this gathering is to introduce you to ideas and people you might not already know, to inspire you to action, and to help you connect with allies, collaborators, and support a network to keep you going. Some of the things that we do to make sure that this gathering is practitioner focused are that we pay the presenters to come. We have a lot of scholarship support and we put a lot of focus on making sure that people can get here through scholarships and travel support. And new this year, we have a kids track um, so there are a group of young people on their own track at this conference with amazing teaching artists to make sure both that it's more feasible for parents to attend the conference, uh, but also that we're investing in the people who are going to carry this work forward into the future. The second value of... <laughs> The second value of this gathering is that we are interested in creating a more complex narrative about what rural is. We are living in a moment when many people are writing a narrative of rural America. The majority of these authors are not rooted in a rural place, and we collectively are invested in reclaiming a more complicated narrative about the opportunities, assets, and challenges of rural life. We want to amplify voices that are often intentionally left out of the narrative of rural communities, and we hope that the stories you hear over the next three days are stories that you can carry with you to counter narratives that seek to harm, divide, or write off the culture, value, and complicated history and future of rural places and people. I could pretty much stop and just read the whole program to you at this point in terms of which sessions those are. Um, but just as an example, during one breakout, you could attend a session on the Lao imagination, building an inclusive rural refugee arts voice, or fighting for visibility, cultural sensitivity, and using the language of art from Native Artists United, and many, many other amazing sessions. The third value is rural-urban solidarity. That narrative that I talked about that's getting written by someone else, it often focuses on this divide between rural and urban places. And I think it's important that anytime we hear a narrative about divide, we ask who benefits from that narrative. And there are people who benefit tremendously from power and from wealth by keeping us divided. Our own experience at Springboard, holding space in two places, both urban and rural, having two contexts and two homes, has made us even more invested in creating solidarity across those contexts. In particular, we believe there is great value and power in building solidarity and connection between rural places and underinvested urban neighborhoods. Recognizing that every community is different and faces its own specific challenges, we know we can work together to counter and repair the systemic extraction and disinvestment that rural and urban communities face and create opportunities for shared work, shared purpose, and recognize that our future is interdependent and intertwined. 
We hope this summit helps forge connections across urban and rural communities, creates pathways to share ideas, and builds new friendship, partnership, and collaboration. For us, this work has been hard, it has been important, but most of all, it has been joyful to find the similarities in our own two communities and to share ideas and differences and celebrate our shared future. We know from our experience at Springboard that technology can take you pretty far in building those connections, but there's no substitute for being in the same room together. So to all of my urban friends who are here, welcome and enjoy. The final value of the summit is that it is and always will be locally centered. We believe that it is so important that this gathering takes place in a rural community in a small town because what we feed grows. And we know that by collectively putting our dollars, attention, and energy in a small community, we're not just talking about rural economic development, we are rural economic development. It also gives us the opportunity to amplify and connect with the creative people power that exists in every community. So please enjoy your experience in Grand Rapids. Connect with this community. Think about how this place is different and alike to the place that you come from. And please leave your money here. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of wonderful opportunities tonight to support local artists and local makers. Another way that we're centering what's local and what's here is by starting today with a wonderful conversation about the creative people power that exists in this very community with our first panel, which is moderated by the wonderful Whitney Kimball Coe. Whitney serves as coordinator of the Rural Assembly, a rural movement made up of activities and partnerships geared towards building better policy and more opportunity across the country. In 2017, she was a featured speaker at the inaugural summit of the Obama Foundation and a guest of the radio program On Being with Krista Tippett. In 2018, she spoke at the Aspen Ideas Festival. Her focus on building civic courage in communities is directly tied to the, her practice of participation in her hometown of Athens, Tennessee, where she lives with her husband, Matt, and daughters, Lucy and Savannah. When Whitney comes up, she'll help us get to know the panelists that she's going to moderate. But before we hear from this panel, we have one, one more treat for you. <laughs> um, I'm thrilled to invite Annie Humphrey to the stage to share her music with us. I'm going to share just a little bit of Annie's biography. Growing up on Leech Lake Indian Reservation in northern Minnesota, Annie lived in a home filled with voices made of thunder, and nothing could stop it. Her parents were brilliant people individually, her father a singer and musician, her mother an artist and poet. Together, they made sadness. Each of her parents taught Annie the beautiful things they knew. They showed her that she carried their gifts in her hands, too. This is how creating art and music came about for her. This is what saved her. This is how she lives now. Please welcome Annie Humphrey. Check. Thank you, Miigwech. You know, I hear people say, I'm not an artist. I dabble, but I'm no artist. Or, yeah, I try to play guitar, of course, but I'm not a musician. But you are. And um, I, I went to a show in Minneapolis, and there was this young man who had he dove off a cliff in Rio, and he broke his neck. And he, um, he plays piano with a, like a screwdriver with a rubber tip, and he just like, he'll just do this. And then he has this beautiful singing voice, and he just sits and... And so that inspired me musically to do this next song where I just use two fingers. Because you don't have to be a master of an uh, instrument to play music, and you don't have to be a creative writer to write what you think. So um, I just encourage people not to, don't worry about it. This song is called Eat What You Kill, and it's just about accountability, being accountable for the things we say and the things we don't say, and if it hurts somebody, the things we do and we don't do that might hurt someone, or, or we could have done some good, but we didn't. It's about being accountable. And like Gary said, that, that goodness between people. You mock my child's wisdom And you crush it under your heel do is eat 
what you kill Something in you is satisfied When you see the defeat in their eyes Get ready, cause I'll be there in a while And you can't pick on someone your own size Cause I eat what I kill the hunter slings his rifle and puts tobacco down And he drops a deer with a single round And he lays his hand upon the dead body now And says my spirit and my stomach will be filled Cause I eat what I kill do we remind you of that great lie That you belong here more than I Then just say this, you're inferior to me State your hate to my face if you will And eat what you kill I served four years in the military Got tattoos, brown skin, and a college degree And I do my best to see the other side of things And if I can't, I promise I will Eat what I kill you kill eat what you kill eat what you kill thank you thank you Easy landing. Yeah, there we go. I, I almost don't want to speak now. Just um, want to sit with that. Thank you, Annie, so much. Uh, well, good morning. My name's Whitney Kimball Coe. Um, I'm from Athens, Tennessee, which is near the Smoky Mountains. Um, I'm a mother and I'm an artist, I dabble, but I'm an artist too. We're all artists, um, thank you, Annie. And I'm just really honored um, to be up here with this group of Northwoods creative people um, whom I just met uh, a couple of phone calls ago and then just this morning we had an incredible conversation back here in the green room that I'd like to try to recreate for you out here and maybe we'll have some new surprises as well. Um, what we're here to do today, I think, is to, to launch you all into this space, this region, um, by introducing you to some of the most uh, incredible creative people that we know in this space. Um, so I, I'm going to invite them to introduce themselves to you, and I'm going to kick it off by asking them to, to tell you not only their name and, and, uh, and uh, introduce themselves, but also introduce their neck of the woods to you. Um, by telling you a bit about what it feels like, what it maybe smells like, um, what, uh, what they remember about the space where they grew up. Um, so if you don't mind, we're going to start actually with Mira at the end um, and work back this way. So just give us a little bit of um, a description of your Northwoods, your neck of the Northwoods. And please introduce yourself, yes. <laughs> All right, hi everyone, I'm Mary Villiard. I grew up on the Fond du Lac Reservation in Cloquet, Minnesota, and currently work at the American Indian Community Housing Organization in Duluth, Minnesota, which isn't too far from there. 
Um, and I'm also a visual artist and community organizer. And when I think of my, the place that I grew up, I think of mm, really big night skies. And I think of kind of like the, I don't know, it, Fond du Lac's kind of swampy. Um, and so there was a little creek uh, that flowed um, by the house that I grew up on. I, I grew up on a hill with a church at the top, and there was a graveyard across the street, <laughs> and a creek that I grew up seeing like grow into a much bigger creek um, that eventually took out our road during the 2012 floods <laughs> when we had to be evacuated then. Um, but yeah, I just think of the, the moisture in the air and the, the softness of the ground and the sap bubbles on the tree that I used to pop <laughs> with my finger as a kid. Um, and yeah, I deal with a lot of chronic pain stuff. So when I was older, dealing with chronic pain in my arms and stuff like that, I used to go down in the springtime and stick my arm in that creek that was like ice cold water and probably like the only relief that I could get when my arm was just on fire. So those are, I don't know, bits and pieces of memories of that place and occasionally I'll drive back and just feel the air. Yeah. I'm uh, J. R. Smith DeCue. Uh, I come to you from Grand Marais, Minnesota, uh, where I serve as the mayor of the city. Uh, I also own some businesses there. Um, I teach some classes. I, I, I dabble in music and, um, and other teaching uh, throughout the community. So, so that's I think that's why I'm here. Um, uh, for, for those of you that have been to Grand Marais, I hope that what I say, like, click some things on in your brain. Um, when I think of Grand Marais, it's not so much a smell or a sight or anything, it's more of a sound. So if you can, if you can picture in your mind millions and millions of tiny round stones rubbing against each other and bashing into each other and rolling in and rolling out, and the sound that that makes, which is almost like a million people clapping their hands. Um, that's what, I, what I, I put in my brain when I, when I think about home now. And um, even though Lake Superior is very loud, she doesn't like to sit still very much. I mean, we have that in common. But um, <laughs> that's one of the things that I've grown to appreciate about that area. And the other thing that I really enjoy about, about the North Shore is that you can have that that dichotomous feeling of both being incredibly warmed by the summer mm -hmm. sunlight and then also being frozen to death by the lake wind. <laughs> so, so that's one of the strange dichotomies of living up there is that, that you're always gonna be cold, but there are so many things that can warm you up. Mm -hmm. So that's when I think of Grand Marais. That's beautiful. My name is Sonia Merrill, and I live here in Grand Rapids. I've been here for about seven years, and today I'm here as a volunteer. I serve on the Grand Rapids Arts and Culture Commission as the chair. And I have a couple of homes, but they have always been rural. I grew up in the woods on the edge of what I would call a forest in Denmark, uh, on the edge of a national forest. And now I live in woods that are much wilder. I love them. And despite growing up in nature, uh, what brings me back and what, what warms me uh, has always been centered around people and what they did together in community. I think of my mom who started our local rural arts and culture center, if you will. Um, some of my earliest memories have to do with walking around that community center. There are about 80 families who came together to buy that center and I walked around with a little paint bucket and I painted all the waste paper baskets. And uh, that's kind of how we came together. It has always sustained me, the way that people come together to do things that are not possible with private institutions or government, but people coming together to save a place that they love. So. Buju. Mama Duyashka and Dijnikaz. Gamaskwa Wakakag in Dunjiba. Nimin Wendam Nagashkunan, Nimin Wendam Nagashkunan. I don't know how to say it in the plural, so I could say it's good to meet each of you, 
or I could just learn in Ojibwe how to plural it, huh? <laughs> but um, I, I grew up in Cass Lake, which is like, for those of you who don't know, the, Cass Lake is like the business hub of the Leech Lake Res, our tribal operations and judicial head start, you know, all that stuff is in that town. But you know, I um, growing up, all I wanted to do, all I wanted to do was leave. All I wanted to do was get out of there. I remember being in junior high and being like, if I don't get out of here, no one will ever find me. I, you know, and that's what I would, that, that was my whole thought. So I did, and that, that is why I, I did end up enlisting in the Marine Corps, not out of a patriotic, um, you know, yearning. It was just like, that was the way off, right? They're, they gave me an airline ticket, clothes, three meals a day, a place to live, and all I had to do was whatever they told me. <laughs> so, but I was in, um, my first duty station was in Japan, and I was, it was raining really, really hard, and we were out in the field, and, and it's like, you know, it, it's miserable, and you're wet, and you have to do this night stuff, and land nav, and all this nut stuff, and it was just a really miserable time, but I remember one, that one morning the mail trucks came up and they also brought hot chow up the mountain. And that, those were two like amazing, amazing things that would happen in the time we were in the field. But I, I got my mail and it was a little cardboard box and it was from my dad. Now my dad, he don't really, he's not the kind of guy that smiles too much and he certainly doesn't write letters and he certainly doesn't send packages to Japan. But it was soggy and wet, and I opened that, the box up, and I, I saw what it was, and I walked away to be by myself, and I slung my M16, and I turned my cover around, and I unzipped it, and it was wild rice. And I remember sticking my face in that bag, because nothing smells like wild rice, like hand, you know, at home, parched wild rice. The smell of the lake, right, the smell of the water, the smell of summer, the smell of rice, the smell of, you know, everything. So I remember being in Japan, getting a package from that place I never wanted to go back, realizing in Japan that I can't live anywhere else. So that's how I got back mm. home. Mm. That was nice. Bonjour, back up you, Sequin de Genicas. My name is uh, Delina White in English. My Ojibwe name is Wades in the Water, and I'm uh, Bear Clan. I am from the Leech Lake Reservation, which is approximately, mm, what, 30 miles from here? 30 miles west of here is where the border begins. Um, I'm, we have uh, 14 villages that's a part of the reservation. I live in the village of Anigam. When I go to town, I go to Walker. When I go to Walmart, I go to Park Rapids. <laughs> when I go to Tires Plus, I go to Bemidji. When I go to Walmart, I go to Grand Rapids. <laughs> so I am kind of centrally located. Oh, and I go to Brainerd, too. So um, I'm about 60 miles from any larger city. So Grand Rapids, for me, is a large city. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I um, come from the same place where Annie comes from, and um, Mary. Mary. No, 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 no. Oh, the, oh, Gary. the medicine man. Oh, Gary. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm sorry, Gary. So um, we are um, related. I want to uh, welcome everybody to our um, homeland. I was. Uh, a little girl of six years old when my grandmother started teaching me to, how to do beadwork. So I am currently a native apparel designer, a beadwork artist, and a jewelry maker. Um, at the age of six, I started doing beadwork with my grandmother who taught me how to string beads on a thread. And we lived in a little two-room shack um, that had no running water or electricity. And we would sit in the shack and we would look on the uh, Agency Bay, which is uh, right on the shores of Leech Lake. And I remember the water just glistening and being so beautiful. And my grandmother um, was a master beadwork artist. And she would do the floral 
uh, flat stitch work on, on velvet and um, smoke hide. And I told my grandma, I said, the water is as beautiful as a pair of beaded earrings. <laughs> Uh, and that's what I can relate to sometimes of the colors of um, hot rods or muscle cars. They're so awesome. I'm like, oh, that color is as, so pretty as a pair of beaded earrings. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and so right now, I currently live in um, Anigam. And although throughout my life, I was uh, part of the relocation program because I'm 55 years old. So I have been a part of uh, the United States government's um, laws and acts in dealing with Native Americans. So um, that act was to relocate Natives into major cities to try to uh, assimilate them into um, the Western world. And my father was promised many things like a job and housing if he would move off the reservation, uh, which we did. He brought my mother and myself <clears throat> but those promises were not kept. And so we were um, kind of isolated in these larger cities. And I've lived in Chicago, Houston, Minneapolis, and Milwaukee, um, trying to find a life for ourselves. And um, my wish was always to move back home, uh, to be uh, in Anigam in the Leech Lake Reservation, and I'm so happy that when I was 18 years old and I became an adult, I was able to return home. So I live in my uh, paternal grandmother's house right now. It's <clears throat> real small, but it's on the lake, and it's where I'm most happy. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing um, a little bit about yourselves with us. I feel like if we had all day, the stories would be, would just continue to flow. Um, and we still have some time. So I want to think about um, this idea of creative people power. And everybody has a copy of the creative people power report in your, in your um, bags, I think. And hopefully you've had a chance to read it or you will get a chance to read it. I want to explore the words creative people power and particularly the word power and um, how it manifests itself in your work and in your communities and how you're wielding it in a way. Um, so I, I don't want to direct that at any one person. Just uh, if you feel uh, like you've got something to share about that, how, how is the power portion of this playing out in your, in your community and in your, and in your work? I can, I can start and talk a little yeah. bit about, about how that impacts the area of, of my involvement, so, so local government. Mm -hmm. um, Grand Marais has been an arts community for, for a couple of generations now. Um, the Grand Marais Art Colony uh, is a very strong presence as well as the North House Folk School, and there are dozens and dozens of local artists that, that make their living uh, creating and selling their arts. Uh, to visitors that come up there, and now with the advent of internet such, um, they can do it all online too. Um, one of the things that, that has changed in Grand Marais because of the creative people power that exists in our community and that's been encouraged by these organizations and encouraged by the, um, by the, by the city council, uh, we've been working to, to try and remove barriers to creative activities within the city. Um, we, last year we adopted uh, a group an arts commission of sorts to work with the city and to advise the city on policy making and and we call that the creative economy collaborative because it is made up of artists in our community a lot of them are here actually um, who are actively shaping our economy through their creative exploits and so so the, what we figured the best way to do that like to actually funnel that power into a meaningful way is to have that creative energy actually help us direct the city policy. Because if we don't do that, if we don't actually incorporate that creativity into the city policy, then, then what are we doing? You know, why are we working on, on creating a creative space if we don't have policies that reflect that creativity? Mm -hmm. so, so that's, for us, that's, that's a really big part of the power, is that we're actually seeing that power work its way into the policy making that undergirds how the city itself functions. 
And, and through that, we can then create space for public art. We can create space for different types of, of enterprises that encourage different types of art. So that's, I mean, that's kind of the, I'm not the active power person, but it's impacting all the stuff that I do, which is, which I think speaks to the point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, and Annie, I wanted to come back to you and your story about coming home and, uh, or, well, first, wanting to leave and being so worried that if you didn't leave, you wouldn't be found. And I wonder if um, this, this conversation about creative people power and, and the power that you find within yourself um, can happen in any place mm -hmm. or can it, is, oh, yeah. is it, does it, it have to happen in your... Oh, no, no, it happens everywhere. It happens okay. sitting here, it happens everywhere because we are power, you know, human beings, at the atomic level, only 20% of us is mass, and the rest is all scientifically, you know, with physics, you know, it's, it's energy, but it's spirit. So we all are power. Wherever we go in this world, we're power. But I think about um, where I see power happen is at our powwows. And you see people doing their own beadwork, and, and oh my God, I see Delena's husband and son, and I'm like, if what all that beadwork and that beautiful art represents how much they're loved by this woman, oh my, you guys gotta go to a powwow and see. But if you haven't been to a powwow there, um, you know, and there, there's other um, tests, scientific research done where when, when you do hear a, a beat, a, if any, everyone listens to a single beat, it, within minutes, all of our pulses will match. So imagine that power, our hearts all beating literally as one, not just saying, oh, we should be as one, but where our hearts all are on the same, that same beat. And so at a powwow, we're all moving in this direction, right? So that's an energy flow. There's an energy flow happening. And then, and then the, the songs and the voices and the feelings and, and the color and the love, you know, to me, when, when that question came up about what is your, when you think about people creating creative power, to me it's that circle at a powwow. Mm. And, and so if you haven't been to one, go to one. It doesn't matter if you're you know, non-native folks that step into a powwow ring and dance, to me, are very, very special, courageous people. Because, um, you know, do it. Because we have to step out into this world every day. I leave my house where my sage and my medicine and my drums and my dresses and all my stuff, and you step out into this Grand Rapids, and it's almost like you're stepping into a, this other place where you don't get to see your reflection. So, um, yeah, do it. Go, go step, step into a power, step into that circle and see how awesome it feels, power. That's wonderful. I could address something too. <clears throat> so that reminds me of, um, first of all, um, giving thanks to our tribal council. Because um, if you look at like Maslow's uh, hierarchy, in order to go out and be, you know, a person that's functioning and um, creating purpose and meaning in the world, you have to have some basic needs that are met. You have to be able to um, have your belly full. You have to be able to have a place over your head where you can sleep at night and um, have your health. So um, I, I really appreciate our tribal council who takes care of us that we have uh, the reservation, our land that we can call home, the land that we call ours, um, and providing us with the basic needs and support to just be alive and to live and to be people. And then when you go outside of that, we need opportunities to be able to do the things that we love to do and that we love to share, such as our art. And then there are those of us who take our art even a step further and who use our art as a way to make a living for ourselves so that we can do broader things like uh, pay for our electricity <laughs> and our propane. <laughs> 
the things that um, we further need to be um, outside of what our tribal council can do for us. And um, that seems to be a luxury, those opportunities. And they're not often, and what I'm thinking about is like the state arts boards, the um, grants, the funding people who, who um, create opportunities for us to be able to say, hey, you know, this is what we can do. What we do is kind of interesting, and sometimes it's, it's really pretty. And um, that is like few and far between, and then it's very competitive. So um, I'm grateful for those organizations who do um, appreciate the arts and who can further um, go into what is separate and distinct for our tribal nations. Um, <clears throat> I have reached a point in my art that I am able to further create opportunities with, with other artists who can work with me in collaboration and um, create more um, opportunities for, for more people to do um, some professional works. Um, I do a lot of showing of my work in the form of fashion shows, photography, videos, and um, I work with models, I work with hairstylists and makeup artists, camera crew, light crew, um, music crew, venues. So it kind of is, a negajuan is how you say it in Ojibwe, but it's like when you throw a rock into the lake and it ripples out. So um, for me, that's people power, um, is opportunities and collaboration. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I, I want you to speak about, I'm sorry, um, uh, Mary, I want you to speak about uh, what you're doing in Duluth right now and how th you're seeing this renaissance of, or I mean maybe for the first time, indigenous artists and indigenous art and storytelling is coming um, to fruition. So can you tell us a little bit about that power that's yeah. happening? I was gonna say, Delina talking about collaboration yeah. being part of what you know makes for power. Um, yeah, so Duluth is a place that's sort of an artsy city. Um, and for a long time, I think artsy has been kind of a little bit limited to sort of touristy things, pictures of boats and railroads and you know the history of Duluth. Um, to what has been seen as, I guess, the, the um, majority or, yeah, mainstream demographic of folks who, who live there. Um, but in the last 10 years, I would say, um, I guess there's been a shift in, in what we're seeing as far as what's represented in uh, the stories of Duluth, because Duluth historically is a, is a really significant cultural center for the Anishinaabe people. Um, and their stories just abound about every plant, every landmark, every single aspect of the space has a story. And those stories for a long time have been, I feel, um, not accessible to many people, whether they're native people or otherwise. Um, and so kind of a, a motivation that I've had in working at ACO and in working with other indigenous artists is to really um, take every opportunity we get to, to collaborate together and to utilize the, the little opportunities we might get, like a little wall or you know <laughs> anything like that. Um, opportunities to speak, to really come together um, and build, build a narrative or build up our narrative collectively. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, statistically uh, in Duluth, our homeless population, or our entire population of indigenous people is about 3%, and then our homeless population is 30% Native American people. And if that isn't reflective of colonization and displacement and disconnection, I don't know what is. <laughs> and so um, kind of the stories that we get of Native people are always talking about them as homeless or as you know alcoholics and things like that. And that's the narrative that's portrayed. And so we found through arts and culture that, um, yeah, arts. The, the arts have been a way for us to get out our stories and to show contemporary narratives too. 
because there's lots of different aspects to being indigenous outside of you know growing up on a reservation or looking native or um, speaking the language. There's all there's so many different facets. Whether you grew up in foster care or um, went to the boarding schools and were were separated that way, and so art has allowed us to look at being indigenous um, and look at all of those collective, you know, different diverse identities of being indigenous and come together and see each other and show the world too, you know, this is who we are and um, legitimize each other. Because I feel like a lot of historically in, in indigenous people have been just not legitimized. And even within the community too, it's sometimes, you know, that happens and that's because of all the trauma. But. Yeah, <laughs> little rant, but. <laughs> yeah. Sonia, I wanted to invite you to respond to that question as well about power and how that's manifesting itself, or pe creative people power, how it manifests itself in Grand Rapids. Also, I wondered if you wanted to say a bit about your thinking around freedom and safety um, for, uh, for all people, but also for, in order to be creative and powerful as an artist. Those, those basic needs that need to be met. So start wherever. That's a, that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> hey, we've got so, time, we're good. Yeah, there's so much to say about arts and culture development and power you know, in Grand Rapids, and I'll, I'll get to the safety part as well. Um, we don't, I don't think I've, un, until we lately have started discussing it like this, I haven't really seen it. As somebody who comes at things from like a, a community development lens in a way, you know, there's traditional community development. You know, we've had a, a culture of mining and logging in this area. And traditional community development resources have often been put that way in kind of rigid ways. And um, I think of community development in a completely different way with people at the center. And I have seen the work of the Grand Rapids Arts and Culture Commission as kind of an example of that, how we've been nibbling away at the traditional power in really creative ways you know, with the city council and with private businesses and sort of plucking away at, at, at individuals who have been willing to come with us and have broken the rules a little bit and have created spaces where we haven't been before, where we just kind of start saying yes to things that we've never done before. Um, so I, that's been really, really interesting. Just in this last couple of weeks, if, you, if you've walked around town, you've seen a lot of new art. And, and that's sort of been a result of that. We've just made the decision to create a structure within the city. And I've been lucky um, with others here in the audience to have been invited to be part of that, um, where we now, we, we, we have infiltrated the, the, the public sphere. We, we have money, we have set-asides. We, we have a commission and we have decision-making power around the arts which is important, and, and we take that power and we go to a private business person and say, hey, would you like this on your wall? Can we have an easement? You know, we're asking those questions that we've never asked before, and people are saying yes. They don't always say, say yes right away to everything that we've asked for, um, but they say yes to accepting art into their lives in a new way. So um, I feel like that has, we, we, we've, Power has to be kind of taken, taken. We take it in those spaces. We have an artist who wants to hang some art and work with kids and hang it on trees right in the middle of the city and we don't even know who to ask. So we just do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I say we with a giant we, you know, it's not me. I told you before that I'm an arts advocate but I feel like I look for those spaces where we can nibble away at those opportunities which is how we ultimately get there. But I also, so then I, and then I'll stop talking. What I was saying before when we were sitting in the green room that we have to recognize all of us that we come to this work with different kinds of privileges and the older I get, the more I realize how lucky I was, I'm gonna try to say this without crying, mm -hmm. that yes, I grew up in a rural community, but I, I grew up safe. You know, I, I grew up without a lot of violence in my life and, and I was not an oppressed person and, uh, and it allows us, um, when we recognize that, you know, it can, it can also set us free to just, you know, do things and, and be brave in, in ways that are different um, and still valid from folks here at this panel who were not so lucky, right? Who were in fact part of an oppressed people. 
And so um, I think it behooves all of us to remember how we arrive at the freedoms that we can now express. So anyway. Thank you. Um, I wanted to also ask you all to get real uh, with me about, and with all of us, about um, how difficult it can be to, to move the needle, to, to bring that power to bear in your spaces um, with, with the people you're collaborating with or the people you're seeking to collaborate with. Um, if anyone wants to speak to this, uh, uh, what is a challenge that is staring at you right now that you're working to overcome? You don't have to drop any names or, or you can and we'll, um, we'll work it out together. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but what is what is a challenge that's in your way right now that um, that you're working on overcoming? Well, to me, it's not really a challenge for me okay. because um, I don't feel like I'm at any table even, mm -hmm. right? But that's okay too because I, you guys, I paint murals in my house, I paint my sofa, I paint my floor. I'm the kind of visual artist mm -hmm. that only needs to please myself. So if I'm painting murals in my house and they're not on in the public, am I any less an artist? I don't, I don't know. But I feel like in, in this community, for me, I, I don't have a place. I do not have a place anywhere in this town. Um, and, but you know, Kayla, I appreciate her presence in this town, and I see it, and I see, I see things that happen. And, and Katie, too. You girls over there, it's awesome, thank you. But I feel like, you know, okay, so the next step, letting, letting someone paint Indians on their business, why don't you hire some? Because I know that it's, it's so hard to, yeah, so like, I have a niece, I have a niece, and she um, got a job, she came from Los Angeles, she thought, cool, she comes from the diverse place, comes to Rapids, and works at Brood Awakenings. Every day, this woman came in and would just be really rude to her. Rude, just blatant, every day. And um, one day, the woman said to Kayleen, she said to Quay, she said, you know, I'm surprised to see you here every day because most Indians I know don't work. Yeah, just like that. She came home, she left work, she was in tears. I said, you need to tell the owners what happened. You have to tell them. And I don't know if they're here or not, and I don't know if Quay even told them, but they did accept her, you know. She quit working there, and they let that happen. I don't know if they are aware of why or what, but I feel like, okay, now she was, now she's gone from there. And if you, while you guys go out into this community, I got this tattoo on my face, and I go shop for my horses in the feed store, and, you know, I kind of got stared at before, but it's the, the, the feeling and the energy in this town is quite strange. It is quite strange. And um, I'm not sure what can be done about it. I'm not sure what can be done about it. All I know is it's there. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's a huge problem, right? It's a huge thing. It's a huge, where do you start? So what I do is I stay home and I teach my sons and my daughters and my grandkids about racing and all these, these arts, right? And the thing, I mean, they are art. The, the things we, the equipment we use is art. It's beautiful stuff. And um, so that's where it's at for me, in my house, in, in the four walls of my own house. Because I, I feel like I can't go out and talk about being peaceful and good to one another when kids in my house are arguing or we can't be using oil when you know, I'm, I'm doing it in my, own, in my own house, and we're all addicted to that, too. But this, to me, this art, for me, is like the human, I address the human condition, okay? It's not about what can I sell. Because, you know what, if you guys hear me, my music is not entertaining, and I have a new record coming out, and it's super unentertaining. <laughs> but I am going to be playing here at the Rife in November sometime, so if you want to be super unentertained, come watch. <laughs> I don't know, one thing I always think about when I end up, um, I mean, lately there's been sort of a movement towards creative placemaking, and that's kind of one of the buzzwords in, you know, arts and nonprofit world, and um, 
it's been interesting being in those circles and hearing about, you know, a lot of people in, are interested in creating new histories or making history with their with the work that they're doing through the arts. And as an artist, I'm all for, you know, promoting the artists, but sometimes I feel a little conflicted about the the language we use in creative place making about like place making as if the place isn't already something um, or as though yeah that there's not a history that's already there that's not addressed and it's hard for me to see you know sometimes in those conversations uh, you know creating a new history when you haven't addressed the history that's already there or that's already been you know cut out a little bit um, and so that's been a challenge that I've been sort of looking at in all the work that I've been doing about, you know, what are the stories of place? And if you don't think there's a story of the place, you're wrong, because <laughs> indigenous people were everywhere. You know, there's, there's reservations and tribal land across this country um, with people who have that knowledge. And if you haven't heard it, then there hasn't been the space for that knowledge to be shared. And so what are you doing about creating that space so that knowledge can exist, you know, publicly. And um, yeah, that's something that I've been really intrigued by lately. Because I think the creative placemaking that's happening is, is of benefit to, to everybody in communities. But it's also, I feel like, a missed opportunity for folks who are looking at just creating a new history or a new, you know, thing that um, brings in tourists or, you know, brings in business. So I think that's something to keep in mind as you're working in your communities. Um, even in rural communities, if you feel like there isn't, you know, this this story of place, mm -hmm. there is. <laughs> Jay, you've been in uh, Grand Marais for ten years, yeah. Um, and does what uh, Mary's saying resonate with you as you're trying to think of uh, the, the art strategies that are going to um, uh, be work work out in your in your new or in, well in your community in this community. Um. Yeah, I mean it, it certainly does, and and that one of the things that we struggle with up in Grand Marais um, when it comes to creating this identity is you know we're next door to to the Grand Portage Reservation as well, and all of the students that go to the um, to the uh, Anishinaabe school up in Grand Portage end up going to the high school in Grand Marais. And so, so they get this fabulous cultural education at their own school, and then they come to Grand Marais, they come down there, and they teach Anishinaabe in our school, which is fabulous. It's absolutely wonderful. I love hearing some of the kids on the cross-country team like talk to each other in Anishinaabe. Like, that's so cool! Mm -hmm. Like, that's a really, really special thing for me. Um, but it, it also puts these kids in a really challenging spot. Because you know, these we're, we're graduating classes of 40 kids. You know, I mean, and and 20% of those kids are Anishinaabe, and and then we've got another 30% of those kids who are low income, like legitimately low income, and then we've got another 30% of those kids who are kind of middle classy, and then we've got 10% of those kids who are who are wealthy, like mm -hmm. wealthy, and so when you break down those numbers into classes, and there's 40 kids per class, that means the Native American students hang out with the Native American students. The poor kids hang out with the poor kids. The middle class kids hang out with the middle class kids. And the wealthy kids hang out with the wealthy kids. So that's, that is a huge struggle for us to, I, to, to try and work with the demographics that we've been given to maintain this identity that we have as Grand Marais. I mean, Grand Marais has never been a wealthy place. Grand Marais has always been fishers and loggers and trappers. And they are not the ones who, who build stadiums. You know, they're the ones who, who, who gather the resources. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a constant struggle for us to, to try and rewrite that narrative, but to still respect the communities that we've got. And, and that's, um, that kind of bridges into, like the challenge that I face, which I think piggybacks on that, is that inaction is action. And especially when you're talking about a small community, if you have people with really great ideas but they don't take any action, then that is your action. That is the action that you have taken. And uh, our city council um, changed over when I got elected. I got elected five years ago. And since then, we have worked really, really hard to accomplish a lot of things that had just hadn't been prioritized. But the thing that really breaks my brain is when we have so many high priorities. You know, how is our relationship with Grand Portage? How is our relationship with 
the school? How is our relationship with the county? How, like, how can we, um, can we best preserve the quality of Lake Superior? You know, these, these are the things that we constantly think about, and there's only so much bandwidth in my brain. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's the big struggle, and that's why I'm really encouraged to see this gathering of people, because we all live in rural areas, and we are all the additional bandwidth that we need to be able to accomplish things in our own communities. And if you don't have a city council that agrees with you on that, then get them out. Mm -hmm. You can do that. I mean, I got, I got elected when I was 31 years old because the other guy didn't want to run anymore. Like, there was no one else on the, on the ballot. Like, <laughs> you can do that too. We have time for really one more question, so I'm going to piggyback off of your call to action, really. Um, uh, Laura talked about um, how there's this uh, narrative of rural demise. There's a narrative uh, that drives all kinds of rural stereotypes up into the uh, national conversations um, that impacts how, we, uh, how our policies are made, that impacts investment. If you were offered the opportunity, or if you had the opportunity, or you should just take the opportunity to actually, to just uh, pin an op-ed, or write a song, or design something that uh, speaks to the truth of rural as you have experienced it. Anybody want to take on that? What's that call to action? Um, thank you. Well, I want to say that as a, a native person, that uh, my culture and values and beliefs are the foundation of everything that I do. So when you see something that I've made, it has a strong connection about who I am as being Anishinaabe Kwe. Um, I also want to talk about um, individual people, about um, it, it's really difficult to have the door slammed in your face. And I'm sure it happens to everybody. And so what I do is a lot of um, cold calling, picking up the phone and saying, this is what I do. And it's really difficult to explain <laughs> that it's a lot easier to see photos. But um, so yeah, it's been a difficult road, you know, getting my um, art out into the community where people can see it. Um, and I really think that, uh, I, that I want to say that it's about individual people and the people who have um, the ability to say yes or no and who it is that you talk to. Um, I want to support um, Ogichi Dakwe here, <laughs> our warrior woman, um, for what she said about Grand Rapids because I want to say too that it has been difficult for me um, navigating my way through Grand Rapids and um, uh, also, a, a thing that Will I Am said from the Black Eyed Peas is that <laughs> when opportunity knocks, I answer the door. <laughs> so um, when I've come to Grand Rapids, I had received a really large uh, grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board. Sue Jens, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, $75,000 for um, a folk and traditional arts grant. And uh, what I said what I was going to do is take my um, project, which was called the um, Great Lakes Woodland Skirts Project, five fashion shows to five prestigious art galleries and theaters throughout the state of Minnesota to show the beauty of our traditional skirts. And um, I came to Grand Rapids, and they have a few different community organizations. And they said no to me. What I was looking for was a fiscal agent. Um, and I didn't think that it was you know, that hard to do. It's just an accountability process. But I want to um, give kudos to Talia Palmer, who is the executive director at the Northwest Community Development Center in Bemidji. And I um, approached. I approached Talia and I said, Talia, this is what I need. And Talia said, well, you know, um, we've never done that before, but don't worry about it. Yes, I'll do it. So, um, so she represents Bemidji. 
and um, these other places represent Grand Rapids. So it's, it's um, you know, I don't want to say anything bad or good about either of those cities, because <laughs> it's difficult for natives no matter where we go. And I want to say too, um, you know, about you have to be really uh, a brave, a courageous person um, you, to be native and to be able to show your pride in, in your culture with um, Annie's tattoos and with my ribbon skirts. Because my ribbon skirts are uh, pretty ostentatious. I'm wearing one, and this is kind of a simple one. Uh, they can get pretty elaborate. And the way the community um, sees us is really interesting through the eyes of a Native person. So the reaction I get when I wear my ribbon skirts is that people notice me right away because it's so ostentatious. We love color. Um, Native people will just wear lots of color, and we wear colors that are not considered traditional, such as orange and black, which a lot of people would relate to Halloween, or red and green, which a lot of people would relate to Christmas. And for us, it works. We can do purple and blues and oranges and, and purples and just all these things that are considered not traditional, but to Native people, it's our traditional um, designs. <clears throat> and so once I'm, once I'm seen and once I'm noticed, then I turn invisible and I'm ignored, I'm looked through. So. Um, so that's, that's, that's a courageous thing, is to be able to go out there and accept that you are marginalized and that you are invisible. Mm. And for me, that makes me um, angry. And I don't like feeling that way. I don't like feeling icky feelings. I call it yucky. And so I turn it around and I say, well, I'm going to do more of this. And um, I'm going to do something that makes me happy and I'm going to be um, successful. And so I want to say thank you for the springboards, for inviting me here today to come and speak my truth, and for recognizing me as a viable artist. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. I, I had a really good thought, and I can't think of it. Oh, no. But, but like, you know, um, it is it is a, a feeling of invisibility because I I was out at Standing Rock back when that was happening, and everybody there was so together, man. They were all helping each other and strangers. Hey, how's it going? Hey, hi. I mean, you know, at the camps and in the hotel. I mean, it was like this really. Everyone was tight. You know, no matter what color you were. So I came back to Rapids and I thought maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just a real. Maybe I look crabby, nobody wants to talk to me in Grand Rapids. So I did a little thing, I went to the library one day and I said, hi, start greeting people. And nobody said hi back to me. They would kind of go, but no, you know, I, on my, I greeted five people from inside the library, in the entry, in the parking lot, went to all these. Yeah, no one said hi back, and I just thought, no, it isn't, it isn't me and it's not standing wrong. I mean, it's not, it's Grand Rapids. Mm. And so, and I was talking to John Bauer about this. We were in all these talking about it, and he's like, man, no one talks to you? No, no one talks to me. Man, Andy, that's too bad. But, you know, I mean, it's, it's um, after years and years, it's like, it's almost like, oh, that's the way it is. That's just the way it is. Mm. So, um, um, so, <coughs> But life is grand, I'm happy, and I love, I love my life, and I love all of you. <laughs> Goodness. So, do you, I, want, I want to return to what you said. Yeah, and you know, the, what keep, we need is more of this. Right? I was about to say, yeah. Yeah, it's, there, I think we have to recognize there's a really big unhelpful narrative out there being spoken by really big unhelpful media organizations, and meanwhile, rural media is in decline. Yay, KXE. But this is, this is the answer, right? This is for us to continue to do this. I'm reminded, I know this is you know, the culture I grew up in, but I'm reminded of that, that funny place in, in the quest for the Holy Grail where the two knights are fighting and, 
and one is sitting on the ground and he doesn't have any arms and he wants to fight anyway and the, and the bigger one says, you can't fight, you don't have any arms. And he says, yes I do. <laughs> Meanwhile, his arms are lying on the floor, but you know, this, I feel like that's the kind of spirit that rural people need to have, right? You don't matter, yes we do. And I'll show you exactly how in a thousand ways. And I, I don't know, it sounds just, um, I don't know, just flippant maybe to say that, but I do think it, recall, it, it calls of us to just show up every day and, and to talk about rural and fight more. We see that going on just in the, in the Minneapolis Star Trib, just even these last couple of weeks, about Worthington, right? One unhelpful story, and then luckily a couple of days later, a completely different narrative. So um, anyway, as rural people, we have to tell a really great story. We're strong, we're diverse. We can do things in rural places that nobody else can do because they don't know each other. So anyway, thank yeah. you. Just keep on at it. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just be very short about this. And you know, to address this, this conversation, there aren't many people in rural areas. So be the change. Like, mm -hmm. do it. You know, we were talking before we came out here about about the different partnerships that you can that you can that you can create and what you can do to stand up. And I know that I've, I've stood up a couple of times in Grand Marais when people are getting treated poorly and you just ask them a question about like, well, why, why are you like that? And, and that's, a huge, that's a huge game changer because then people actually have to look at themselves and they might just strike out, they might just be a dick about it. But, but if they're a dick about it, then they're probably just a dick. So, <laughs> so, so own it, like, like own it, make it your space. I mean, you can totally do that. That's, that's, not, um, that's not a hard thing and listen. You know, like listening to these guys talk about their experience, it, I mean, it, it, it makes me wanna go back and add that to another priority list in, you know, that I've got on my list because it's, you know, we just had a new, a new ch tribal chairman up at Grand Portage who is really interested in doing a lot of really good stuff and, and I wanna be a part of that, like I've gotta be a part of that. So thank you. For, for, for lighting that fire. And, and thank you for hearing us and going back to your communities and lighting those fires too because we all need to rely on each other and have that partnership. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, my call to action is always um, encouraging people to look at what's missing. Um, in the narratives of their, their hometowns and the places that they work, and also understanding that, like, yeah, I mean, it, what's missing, by, or what I mean by that is, like, um, I think a lot of the times, okay, example, sorry, rambling. It's cold, so I'm distracted by the cold right now. Uh, <laughs> for instance, ACO, uh, the organization that I work for, we got this water protector mural put up by uh, insurgents, and it's one of the biggest pieces of artwork in Duluth now that's public art, and it depicts uh, a water protector and uh, an indigenous woman. It's one of the only depictions of any person of color that's been created by people of color in the city, uh, in our artsy city. And um, that was something that we just did because it was, we were, we were tired of looking at you know, all of the public art and seeing that like we're missing from the narrative. Um, and sometimes it requires the people in those communities to really just, you know, not necessarily even ask for permission, but to just do stuff to create you know, their visibility. But I um, encourage everyone to look at uh, the spaces that you work in and, and are they conducive to actually allowing other people to create their own spaces and their, their own narratives and to form their narratives. Um, and I know we use the metaphor of like people having a seat at the table. And that metaphor is kind of weird for me sometimes because um, I always think, um, I, I don't know, the table's already always are already sort of set. And are you allowing for people to build their own tables or to use a completely different structure than a table, you know, which requires people to know about the table and then, you know, decide if they like what's on the table. Like, it's just a weird metaphor sometimes. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, but look at what's missing and figure out ways um, to make spaces for people to, to fill in. Um, and also, you know, Speaking on the from the indigenous perspective, people's 
idea of what is Native American um, is just generally wrong, unless you're a Native person. Because <laughs> our history, like, schools don't teach it. You know, in the majority of the US, there's no mention of Native American people in history curriculums. And, you know, there's a whole study that was done um, illuminatives.org is the website, and you can check out all this stuff on you know statistics that have been gathered about um, indigenous representation and why we're seen as invisible and why like people's perceptions are just wrong. Even when you look at funders who are looking to fund native artists and they limit it to just you know what they consider and define as traditional artwork. Um, but when you look at native art, like throughout history, you know beadwork is something that came to be. All the colors that we have are through trading. Right? And so that's an adaptive art form. Like everything, all our materials have been adapted in some way, and that's, that's our art, you know? And so to have funders and, and folks like that sort of put that definition, um, I guess the main point is don't try and define things that you don't know or you didn't grow up in, you know? Um, let people have those spaces themselves and, and build those spaces themselves and make sure you have a, you know, a town that's conducive to people building their narratives. <laughs> So. Perfect. Thank you so much. I'm honored to be on this stage with you all. And let's give, yeah, let's give one more hand for this whole panel. This is wonderful. And with that, I think we're moving on to our next set of programming. Michelle? Is this on? Um, let's give one more thank you to Whitney and our amazing opening panel. Thank you, everybody. Um, I just want to make a quick announcement to help you figure out um, the next thing. Uh, we're asking presenters to try to start as close to the scheduled start time, 11 o'clock, as possible, knowing that people need to take care of themselves, get something to drink, use the restroom. Um, we do want to just try to um, catch up back on our schedule, and it's all good. We'll figure it out. Um, after breakouts is lunch, so we'll, we'll have plenty of time to... Um, to uh, wrap up the breakout sessions and transition back to here. Um, when you leave, if you are attending the breakouts that are here at the Rife, um, they are through either of these doors and behind us. Uh, we have some staff that will help you find your way. Um, I believe we have coffee and some uh, snacks out in the lobby. And if you're going to McRosty or Old Central School, um, the, the bus uh, should be out there ready for you. Um, I'd encourage you to hop on as soon as you can just so we can um, get started as soon as possible. So um, we will see you back this afternoon in the theater at 1.30. Thanks, everybody.